Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Platform-Based Scalable Suspension Process for LVV Production. I'm Tim Wright, Editor of Contract Pharma, and our webcast today is being sponsored by IDT Biologica. They're a global biopharmaceutical CDMO that specializes in the production of innovative live viral vaccines, protein-based vaccines including VLPs, viral vectors for gene and immune therapeutics, oncolytic viruses, and other sterile liquid or lyophilized biologics. Joining me on the line today are three speakers. Sneha Rangarajan is a senior scientist and team lead at IDT Biologica's Rockville site in Maryland. She's part of the upstream process development team where she specializes in the production of vaccines, viral vectors, as well as proteins using mammalian cells. Uh, Shuvajit Banerjee is a senior scientist at IDT Biologica. Uh, he provides analytical assay development expertise to his colleagues and company clients. And Ashvi Rohrbaugh is a senior uh, a scientist too at IDT Biologica. Uh, as part of the assay development team, she is experienced in the development and optimization of molecular and cell-based assays. Today's presentation will showcase IDT Biologica's platform-based approach for lentiviral vector production. Additionally, analytical methods for determining both the physical and functional titter will be described, which are used to assess the efficiency of lentiviral vector production. We will be accepting questions throughout the talk. You can send those in using the box at the bottom of your screen, and questions will be answered after the presentation in a brief Q&A. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can type those into the box as well, and someone on the back end here will help you out. At this point, I'll turn it over to Sneha. Good morning, everyone. My colleagues and I are here to talk to you about our platform-based scalable suspension process for lentiviral vector production. So a little bit background about who we are and where we are located. So we are a CDMO and we have a total of three sites, one in Rockville, Maryland, and two in Germany. So in the US, um, in Rockville, we are um, into developing phase one, phase two clinical trial materials, and we have a process development as well as manufacturing um, suite on site. And in Germany, Magdeburg is involved with process development, while Dessau is a fully approved site for all clinical phases and commercial production. All right, so how does gene therapy unlock the potential of viral vectors? First of all, what is gene therapy? Gene therapy is essentially the replacement of a defective or non-functional gene with that of a corrective or functional gene. And this can be done in one of two ways. The first one is an in vivo strategy where your gene of interest is packaged into the viral vector and the viral vector, which is now your therapeutic, is injected directly into the patient. A very good example that uses this type of strategy would be AAV. The other strategy is the ex vivo one, where the patient's cells are harvested outside of the patient's body, and the viral vector carrying the gene of interest is used to engineer these harvested cells. And now these engineered cells are reinfused back into the patient. A very good example of this strategy is used by um, lentiviral vectors, um, and CAR -T, CAR T cell therapy is a um, good example of this strategy. Now, there are several gene therapy-based drugs that are approved and are on the market, and highlighted here are some of them which use lentiviral vectors as their backbone. So the two examples you see on the top panel are Kimraya and Yescarta, which are used to treat lymphoblastic leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. If you look at the timeline chart underneath, you will notice that in the early 2000s, the approval for these drugs came very sparsely and were much more spread out. However, in the recent years, with uh, more knowledge about these drugs and the comfort um, of using these viral vectors, more and more approvals are now um, seen in this uh, field, and which is highlighted by these drugs that you see uh, in the recent time. Um, the pie chart on the right um, depicts the contribution of the various viral vectors towards these approved drugs. And as you can see, lentiviruses and AAVs are predominantly um, the main contributors towards these. So introduction to lentiviruses. Lentiviruses are about 100 to 120 nanometers in size. They are enveloped virus particles, 
and they carry single-stranded RNA as their genome. They offer stable integration, which means they are able to express long-term, and oftentimes they are pseudotyped with the VSVG gene, which basically replaces their native envelope protein gene, and the reason is to uh, confer broader tropism. Lentiviral vectors also exhibit low immunogenic profile, which is what you want to see in your viral vector. And the most commonly used backbone for these vectors is HIV. The packaging capacity for these viral vectors is about 8 kb. Um, so in reality, of course, the lower you pack, the better the transfection efficiency. So you want to stay under that 6 kb limit. Um, of course, after that, it is a case-to-case -case, uh, basis. And you know, the higher or the more you pack, the transfection efficiency can go down. On the right, you see the life cycle of lentiviruses, where the virus binds to the host cell, and once it is internalized, the genetic material is reverse transcribed, and then the DNA enters the host cell genome, where it integrates with it, and then goes on to be transcribed and translated, and then finally, the fu functional viral particle is um, is prepared and then the viral particle buds off into the supernatant. This is actually one key difference um, compared to AAV where the virus is still within the cell, so a lysis step has to be performed to be able to release the virus. So how much of these viral vectors is needed? And the answer to that is that it is application specific. So if you're looking at a gene therapy uh, that uses in vivo strategy, like AAV does for instance, the amount of dosage required is going to be much more. And the reason is because the viral vector is injected directly into the patient, so it has to contend with the patient's immune system. So the typical dosage you're looking in an in vivo type strategy is about E11 to E16 viral particles per patient, whereas in case of lentiviruses, which are used mostly in a cell therapy type application, um, it doesn't have to deal with the patient's immune system directly, and so the dosage is much lower. And a typical dose ranges uh, between E8 to E10 viral particles per patient. And I also wanted to highlight just the cost of these drugs, um, just to give you an idea. And uh, one example for an AAV drug would be Luxterna, which is used to treat a genetically inherited blindness. And the cost of that is about 425000 per eye. And Kimraya, which uses lentiviruses, um, costs about $475,000. So these drugs are really, really expensive. Of course, the other factor to remember, or the other thing to remember, is that there is a lot of inequality between the demand and supply of these viral vectors. If you look at the graph on the left, you notice how the amount of candidates that have entered the clinical trials at various phases have increased significantly over the recent times. However, um, to meet that demand, we don't have enough supply of viral vectors. And this is acknowledged in the field uh, by several articles, which point out how we have an acute shortage of these viral vectors. And this is one of the main reasons why CDMOs such as ours have entered this, um, this space to bridge that gap between the demand and supply of these viral vectors. So how does one do that? Of course, one way of doing it is by increasing the manufacturing capacity itself but the other way to do it is to optimize your process. And this kind of an optimization needs to be done early on at the stage of process development, because the later you are or the farther along you are in the process, the more you are invested in terms of time, money, and resources. So you need to make sure that this kind of an optimization is done as early as possible in the process. And if you're able to optimize such a process, that is going to lead to higher titers which means lesser amount of materials are going to be needed now, which include your culture, your media, the plasmid DNA, all of which generally tend to increase the cost of production. And an optimized process in turn is just going to serve um, to get better or more doses per batch. Now, what are some of these factors that go into such kind of an optimization? Some of the important ones are listed here, which include cellular platform, scalability, transfection conditions, quality, as well as safety. Now, the cellular platform you, go, you choose um, goes hand in hand with the scalability. So an important question to ask before you start this process is what kind of scales are you targeting and whether your cellular platform is able to achieve that kind of scale. Um, if it is a process that is requiring a much higher titer, much higher, higher yields, 
then you want to choose a suspension system probably because an adherent system could pose a limitation in terms of scalability. The transfection conditions of course play a key role in the transfection efficiency and therefore the final yield. Quality is yet another important factor because you want to make sure that the quality of raw materials you use at the stage of process development are also translated when you go to, go to GMP. So you have to make sure that these raw materials have a counterpart in your GMP space because otherwise if you decide to switch something midway then you have to repeat the process of optimization all over again. And of course safety is a key criteria from a regulatory standpoint which has to be incorporated all along the process. So long story short, you have to begin with the end in mind. So considering all these factors, we at IDT Biologica have designed our gene therapy platform, um, which uses a suspension-based cellular system that uses an HEK293 cell line with a transient transfection mode of production. And we do this to produce both AAV as well as lentiviral vectors, although the focus of the talk today is going to be on lentiviral vectors. So our platform uses a suspension system or a suspension cell type. And the reason for that is because of the challenges posed by the adherent system. Some of the key ones are that the adherent system is more of a scale out type arrangement than a scale up type system. And this is one of the main reasons that there is a limitation on how much you can scale up. And the other important factor is the use of serum. Adherent cells often need the use of serum, which becomes a challenge from a regulatory perspective. And overall, the cost of an adherent type system is much higher compared to their suspension counterpart. And these are precisely uh, some of the reasons why suspension system is used as an alternative, because you can scale up in theory to any imaginable um, scale, and you can scale up in bioreactors um, and are limited just by how much your manufacturing capacity can handle. And the other good thing about suspension cells is that they are serum free, which means there is no animal derived component, which also makes them more friendly from a regulatory perspective. And overall, they have a lower production cost. So we have done our optimizations for a variety of cell lines. We have done this for a high cell density suspension cell line for HEK. We've also done it for a regular 293F derived um, der derivative of um, HEK cell line, and we also are working on a proprietary in-house cell line, which will be available early next year for R&D. Um, in addition, we also offer master cell bank and working cell bank services for client-provided cell lines. The next thing to consider is the choice of plasmid system. So for our platform technology, we use the third generation lentiviral system. And what this means is that majority of the genes from the HIV backbone that um, could lead to the potential formation of a functional virus are removed. And this third generation basically uses the bare minimal backbone that is required for your lentiviral vector to be formed, where the genes are separated on four different, gene, uh, four different plasmids and the chances of a replication competent vector or the replication competent lentivirus forming is extremely rare. And this makes this plasmid system a very, very uh, regulatory compliant um, system. And now I'd like to share with you some of the case studies from our end where we have transferred the expression strategy from small scale shake flasks to um, stirred tank reactors. So we start our process by optimizing for a variety of um, parameters. Some of the key ones are listed here. Um, we start off in the small scale with media screening, transfection cell density, DNA load, plasmid ratios, DNA to transfection reagent ratio, as well as complexation time and volume. Now, the media you use for your process is important to be optimized. And the reason is that there might be some media which might support cell growth really well, but may not be conducive for the process of transfection. So you have to choose something that is suitable and supportive of both processes. And then the cell density at the time of transfection needs to be varied and optimized. And the DNA load needs to be optimized as well. And the DNA load is something that is um, 
that is particular to the cell line that you use. For instance, if you're using a high cell density cell line and you land, land up giving it much lower amount of DNA, then all the cells there don't have enough to make your viral particles. So this DNA load needs to be really optimized for your cell line. And the plasmid ratios, of course, play an important role in making sure that there is enough of each of the gene to form a or package into a functional uh, viral vector. And the DNA to transfection reagent is also another parameter that is important to optimize um, along with the complexation time and volume. Once we do that and um, you know run our experiment, we then down select the candidates that show us promising titers and then go ahead with those candidates to perform the next round of optimization. And this time we go ahead in a scale down model, which is which looks something like a Sartori's Amber 250 system. What the system allows you to do is run a bunch of experiments in parallel, um, which would mimic exactly how a scale-up bioreactor would look like, except in a much smaller volume. So for instance, the Amber 250 um, is run in about a 200, 250 mil volume. And so you're able to optimize a variety of bioreactor-specific parameters like stir speed, DO, pH, um, C train, and what have you in a much smaller volume and are able to run a DOE-style experiment using this um, scale-down model. Here's some data from our shake flask optimization where we screened for media and we looked at optimizing the cell density at the time of transfection, along with screening a couple of different transfection reagents that are commercially available. And by doing that, we have selected some candidates or conditions which were able to give us the titers we were hoping for, as opposed to some others which probably grew well but did not um, transfect well. And so in this case, you see condition one, as well as the last one, gave us the numbers that we were hoping for in terms of physical titers. And so we moved ahead with these conditions for our next round of optimization. So here's some data where we have optimized for the total amount of DNA, the DNA to transfection reagent ratio, as well as the plasmid ratios there within. So if you compare the top panel with the bottom one, they differ in the amount of total DNA used. And you notice that when you use too much DNA, like in this case, the four microgram, um, the transfection efficiency or the titers go down by as high as two logs. And the reason we think for this could have been just that too much DNA would have been toxic to the cells. Um, so you notice that when you use the right amount of DNA, which in this case happens to be that two microgram, you get really good titers and, um, and are much higher than what you get when you use the higher amount of DNA. We've also tried some other um, numbers where we use lower amounts of DNA as well, and then the titer was much lower as well. And then we also compared the plasmid ratios, as you can see here, and of course certain ratios gave us much better titers, again, a two log increase compared to the other ones. Um, we also looked at the harvest time point. In this case, the blue bars indicate the 48 hours post-transfection, whereas the orange ones were harvested 72 hours post-transfection. And of course, as you can see, with this particular transfection reagent, we got a much better titer when we harvested it at 72 hours post-transfection. And here, this graph shows you the functional titer. So um, after getting good physical titers, we also wanted to see if these conditions are giving us good comparative functional titers. And, uh, and surely, we were able to see a very good correlation between the two, um, about a hundredfold difference, and we were able to further down select the conditions which gave us the um, hundredfold difference between the functional, uh, between the physical and functional titers. And so we chose those conditions and then went ahead from the shake flask to the Amber 250 system for that further round of optimization. So here's some data that um, comes in from the optimization that was done in the Amber 250 system. On the left side, you see how this um, Amber 250 system looks like. Uh, basically, you have a bunch of bioreactors um, that are about 200 milliliters volume, and you can run all of them in parallel, and you can run an independent experiment in each of them. So we did that. We varied the pH, the DO, stir speed. We also tried using some enhancers, which were able to actually give us a two to threefold increase in our titers. And we did that here, and you can see what we got on the graph on the right-hand side. Um, and by doing this, we compared both the physical and functional titers, and we went ahead with the last two conditions on this graph for that further scale-up and verification run. 
Um, at this point, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Shivojit Banerjee from Assay Development, who can tell us a little bit more about the assays and how they operate so we can understand what goes on from the assay side. So, Shivojit. Hi, this is Shubhajit Banerjee. In this section, I will discuss different analytical method in order to determine the virus title in the virus preparation. So what is virus titer? Titer is a measurement of virus concentration in the harvested virus preparation. And why it is needed? Because we need this information for downstream infection process. Here, in this section, I will discuss different titer method such as physical titer and functional titer. Physical titer are fast, but sometimes they are overestimated. This is because physical titer can quantify both functional particles, which are infectious particles, and non-functional particles, which are defective or empty particles, as well as they can quantify free capsid proteins or any free viral genetic material depending upon the assay. On the other hand, the functional titer calculate more accurate um, titer and it gives an idea about the functional particles present in the virus preparation. The only disadvantage of this method is it is time consuming. Here are the three different method we are currently using to determine the virus titer. The P24 ELISA method, which is a physical titer method. In this method, we quantify P24 viral capsid protein, which is an indicator of virus titer. The second method is also a physical titer method. In this method, we quantify the viral RNA by targeting a gene of interest. And the third method is a functional titer method. And in this method, we quantify the expression of viral protein in the lentivirus infected cells using flow cytometer. Physical titer, P24 ELISA. So we use P24 ELISA from R&D system in order to quantify the lentivirus particles. P24 is a HIV-1 GAC P24, also known as a capsid protein. P24 is an essential protein for H1, H1V, HIV-1 viral replication and infection of non-dividing cells. The P24 concentration in the plasma is commonly used as an indicator of viral load. And we calculate the lentivirus particles per ml based on 1 picogram of P24 equals to 1.25 into 10 to the power 4 lentivirus particles. So the advantage of this ELISA method is it is very fast and in a day we can estimate at least 15 samples. The only disadvantage is it detect both functional as well as non-functional particles as well as the free capsid proteins. The second method is also a physical titer method where we use 
qRT-PCR in order to quantify the viral RNA. We use a specific primer that direct the gene of interest or the viral mRNA. We use benzonase nucleus treated lentivirus samples and extracted RNA using a viral RNA mini kits from chitin and then we use DNS treatment and our, after that we use qRT-PCR in order to determine the viral gene expression. This is a very robust assay. The advantage is uh, very, this is very fast. The linearity observed up to six uh, logs from 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power uh, 2. And the only disadvantage is like other physical titer, it quantifies both functional and non-functional particles. At this point, I will hand it over the next section to my colleague who will discuss more about the functional assay using flow cytometry. Thank you, Shivajit. Now I'm going to describe the functional titer method we developed for the lentiviral vector process. This method is performed by the quantification of GFP positive sub T1 cells transduced with GFP lentiviral vector using flow cytometry. Sub T1 cells are a suspension cell line which were derived from human T cell lymphoblastic lymphoma. The transduction titer then is calculated based off of the percentage of GFP positive cells after 72 hours post transduction. Even though this method is more time consuming than the two physical titer methods previously described, it is advantageous in that it only quantifies the functional infectious particles. The disadvantage is that it requires a fluorescent target. This could either be your gene of interest, such as GFP, which is what we're using in these assays, or it requires a fluorophore conjugated antibody in order to be analyzed by flow cytometry to distinguish between the infected and uninfected cells. The process for how this method is performed is depicted here in a flow diagram. First, the sub-T1 cells are seeded into a 24 well plates at a density of 2.5 E5 cells per well. 24 hours post seeding, the sub-T1 cells are transduced with the GFP lentiviral vector at different dilutions in a low serum containing medium, which enhances the transduction efficiency. Typically, we serial dilute the lentiviral vectors twofold to generate 11 virus dilutions per sample. Therefore, we can test two samples per 24 well plate, including two wells for the negative uninfected controls. Six hours post-transduction, the culture medium is replenished with complete growth medium to remove the lentiviral particles. The plates are then incubated for 72 hours on a shaking platform in a 37 degree incubator supplemented with 5% car uh, carbon dioxide. After the 72 hour incubation, we evaluate the transduction efficiency by two methods. First, we image the plates for GFP fluorescence using fluorescent microscopy. And then we quantitatively determine the percentage of GFP positive cells using flow cytometry. Here is an example where we are looking at GFP fluorescence after 72 hours post transduction of sub T1 cells. The top panel shows the uninfected sub T1 cells where there is no GFP expression. The bottom panel depicts the GFP lentiviral vector infected sub T1 cells where for this particular sample, there is about 92% of cells expressing GFP after 72 hours. Next, we evaluated these same cells by using flow cytometry using the Agilent Novocyte Pention flow cytometer. We quantified the percentage of GFP positive cells using the flow cytometry, which was then used to calculate the transduction titer. First, we set the gating using the uninfected cells. The top panel shows uh, the uninfected cells, where first we selected for the population of interest in P1 by eliminating the cellular debris and dead cells. Next, in the middle panel, we selected for the singlet cells um, in P2, which eliminated all the doublets. Then in the third panel, uh, the gating was used to separate the GFP positive from the GFP negative cells by using the unaffected cells uh, where ideally all cells should not express GFP. 
in this example, 99.9% .9 of the cells uh, are in the GFP negative quadrant, which is quadrant three. We then use the same gating applied to the GFP lentiviral vector infected cells and looked at the percentage of GFP positive cells in order to determine the titer. You should see a decrease in the percentage of GFP positive cells as the dilutions increase from dilution 1 down to dilution 10. This will be looking at quadrant 4. Then a minimum of three consecutive dilutions that show linear percent GFP positive cells are chosen to calculate the titer. Low dilutions, which have a high concentration of the GFP lentiviral vector, do not pro provide an accurate calculated titer due to the GFP saturation. Therefore, only percent GFP positive cells in the linear range can be used to calculate an accurate titer. In this example, dilutions 7, 8, and 9 were chosen, which demonstrate dilutional linearity since the percentage of GFP positive cells uh, decrease by a factor of two when the dilution increases twofold. As you can see, quadrant four for dilution seven is around 11%, then for dilution eight it's around 6%, and dilution nine is about 3%. To calculate the transduction titer, the following equation is used, where n equals the cell number in each well used for transduction, p is the percentage of GFP positive cells, V is the virus volume used for transduction in each well, and D is the dilution. For this example, the mean titer is calculated based on the linear dilutions 7, 8, and 9, where the average of them came out to be 9.83 E7 transduction units per mil. And now I will pass it back to Sneha, where she will summarize how the data from the physical and functional titer methods help to evaluate this process for efficient lentiviral vector production. Thank you, Ashley. That was very informative. And now I'd just like to summarize what we've done here. Um, so by doing this kind of optimization, we have identified critical process parameters, which have led us to perform a scale-up with a uh, confident reproducibility as well as robustness, which is indicated by a standard and fixed ratio of physical to functional titer. And some of these parameters that we have identified include the DNA load, the plasmid ratios, as well as complexation time, which have served to increase our production or our productivity by about two logs. The complexation time, actually, I should point out, it is not so much important in increasing the titer, but if you get it wrong, you could significantly decrease your titer. So, so it is important in that sense. Um, so overall, like I said, from our unoptimized process to our optimized process, we were able to increase productivity by about two logs and are able to get that high functional titer uh, in the crude bulk harvest. Um, the titers we typically are able to achieve using our reporter gene is about 1 to 2 E10 physical titer, as well as 1 to, e, 1 to 2 E8 transduction units per mil. So while the focus of my talk was mostly from an upstream perspective, I do want to touch upon a little bit uh, from the downstream side as well. A few things to mention are that lentiviral vectors are extremely sensitive, unlike their AAV counterpart, which are much more stable. Um, and this is mainly attributed um, to the fact that they are enveloped, so they are much more sensitive to shear, changes in temperature, extreme changes in pH, um, multiple freeze-thaw cycles, as well as high salt concentrations. So it is really important to do that in-process sampling. So if you notice that at any point in your downstream process that you're losing a lot of virus or there's a lot of aggregation, you need to go back and then optimize that step. But if you don't do that and just look at your final titers, you may not know where in the process you've lost those numbers. So in-process sampling is extremely important for this one. So this slide just shows the overall production scheme for lentiviral vectors where we start with the cell expansion using the HEK293 cells, and then we perform the transfection, the transient transfection. And then once we harvest the viral vector, we then go on with the downstream purification, which typically uses a benzenase step, and then there is clarification, followed by a chromatography step. And this is the part, if you use an uh, affinity chromatography and elute your vector in a high salt uh, buffer, you have to make sure that the lentiviral vector doesn't sit in that high salt concentration for too long because it'll lead to aggregation. So you have to make sure you dilute it out of there as soon as possible. 
And then, of course, this is followed by concentration, buffer exchange, and sterile filtration. Sterile filtration is yet another step where majority of losses occur. Um, the 0.2 uh, micron filtration is very, very crucial, um, and this is what one of the key steps in which losses occur. And the, re and the main reason is that the lentiviral vectors are large. They are about 120 nanometers, which is pretty close to the size of the filter. Um, so you have to make sure the buffer is uh, well chosen and is one that supports um, the viral vector being happy and you know prevents it from aggregating as much as possible. Of course, this is a generic workflow and uh, the final process will vary depending on the size of your construct, the type of your construct, and may look a little bit different than what is uh, highlighted here. So your product needs and specifications will dictate the final process. Um, so to wrap it up um, at IDT Biologica, this is what we bring to the table. We have a fully functional process development team, a formulation development team, as well as assay development team on site. Um, so all the assays and titers you saw today were all done in-house. Um, we also offer cell and virus banking services. We have a uh, fully functional independent GMP manufacturing suite on site as well. And in addition, we also offer fill and finish services. And with that, I'd like to um, thank you all for your attention and we will be happy to take any questions that you may have. All right, thank you so much, Sneha, Shivajit, and Ashi for a really informative talk there. Um, as Sneha said, uh, we do have time to answer some of your questions. Um, if you do have a question for one of the speakers and weren't able to get it in during the talk, now's the time you want to go ahead and do so with the, with the box at the bottom of your screen there. Um, okay, so I'm going to read out the uh, first question here and just uh, I'll leave it to one of you three to pick it up and answer. Um, first question. Our, this attendee would like to know what are some of the important factors that impact transfection efficiency? Thank you, and uh, I can get that. So um, there are various factors, of course, that influence the transfection efficiency. And um, some of the big ones in our experience have been, um, for instance, the total amount of DNA that you load into the cells because like I said before, it is important to make sure your cells have enough to make the viral particle, um, as well as the plasmid ratios there within, because you know um, these ratios dictate how your functional particle is being packaged into the cell. Um, the other things that we observed uh, that you can optimize in boosting your titers are, for instance, adding enhancers. So the one we used, which is sodium butyrate, um, led us to increase that titer by two to three fold. So these are some of the other things you could do um, to impact and positively impact your transfection efficiency. Okay, and uh, this next question kind of jumps off that one and asks, uh, do you have any information on how complexation time affects transfection efficiency? And is there any limit on yes. it? Yes, so um, complexation time, like I was saying earlier, um, is one of those things that doesn't necessarily increase the titer, but you know it could significantly decrease it if you get it wrong. Um, so the manufacturer recommended time for complexation with our um, transfection reagent, which is PEI Pro, is about 15 minutes. So this is easy to achieve, of course, when you're doing those small-scale studies, but when you scale up, um, it is still important to not let that complexation time exceed um, preferably 30 minutes, um, because within that time, it still stays pretty close to what we have seen in the small-scale studies. But if you go more than one hour, it definitely adversely uh, impacts the titer. Um, and we have some data for two-hour complexation times, and we observed a 20% reduction in the transfection efficiency. So you certainly don't want to go um, preferably more than 30 minutes, but certainly not more than an hour. That will reduce the titers. Okay, great. Thanks, Nia. Uh Moving on here, this attendee would like to know what analytical method validation stability and release testing capabilities are available at your site? Yeah, so the methods that we've developed for lentivirus specifically um, are the three titer methods that we described today, the two physical and the one functional titer assay. 
additional analytical method capabilities that are available at IDT Rockville um, include other titer assays such as plaque and focus forming assays as well as PCID50. There are also um, protein assays we have available such as SCS Page, Western Blot, DLS, and HPLC, including size exclusion and reverse phase. Um, we perform different identity assays such as identity PCR and identity by restriction enzyme digest. And then we also have a handful of residual impurity assays that we perform on site, including post cell DNA, post cell protein, residual benzenase, residual SCS, and mycoplasma by PCR, just to name a few. Okay, great. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, let's see here. We have a few more. Moving along, this uh, attendee would like to know Are fluidized bed bioreactors like Icellus bioreactors useful? I think I'm saying that right. Yeah, um, I can get that one. Um, so yes, they are useful, especially you know when you're using the adherent cells. Um, our platform relies on a suspension-based system, so we wouldn't use that. But um, there are labs which produce lentiviruses using isolus bioreactors. I guess some of the factors that go into deciding whether you can use such a system is um, firstly what kind of scales are you targeting and whether your um, adherence cell uh, system is able to get you that. Um, and if the answer is yes, and you're using, let's say, a HEK293 type cell system, um, then you can use a fixed bed bioreactor. Um, when it comes to Icellus, I guess the other thing to just keep in mind is that um, at the moment they offer the 0.5 and the 500 meter square um, areas. So you have to make sure that if you're targeting some a process that is in between, um, you know, let's say you're trying to achieve your phase one, phase two clinical material, which requires not as high as a 500 meter square, but somewhere in between. Um, so that in between scale is not provided by Icellus at the moment. Um, but if you just mean like a general fixed bed bioreactor, then absolutely yes. Um, they have been used and certainly can be useful. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got time for two more before wrapping things up. Uh, this attendee would like to know, how do you assay for GMP LVV without GFP? If GFP was not um, the gene of interest, then the first step would be to um, find an antibody to target the client-specific gene of interest, if that's available. Um, and if not, then targeting other um, lentivirus-specific uh, markers is what we would use for the flow cytometry assay. Okay, great. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, let's see. We've got one more here before we uh, wrap things up. Uh, can you stick with a single functional titter assay? or is expectation to do more? Yeah, uh, we will do, uh, like, uh, we have expectation to do more, like uh, antibiotic uh, resistance assays and all those kind of things, plaque assays. But currently, uh, whatever our, um, like, uh, facilities, we are mainly focusing on the flow cytometry-based assay. Okay, great. Thanks, Shivajit, for that. Um, and that's go. We don't have any more questions that have come in, so that's going to bring us to the conclusion of today's session. Um, thank you again, Neha, Shivajit, and Ashley for the talk. Um, thank you again to today's sponsor, IDT Biologica, and uh, mostly thank you to everyone out there in the audience for your attendance and participation today. Uh, this session will be archived for one year on our website, contractpharma.com. And you'll be receiving an email from us shortly when the session is available for on-demand viewing. Also, today's PowerPoint is available for download. There's a box that says downloadable materials on your screen where you'll find it along with some other uh, materials that have been provided by IDT. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us, everyone, again, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Take care.